Well, I appreciate you guys being here, and also especially this Tempe Expo staff keeping these things going, especially at this time as a real uh, crazy time. A lot of people are just getting pretty squirrely, so getting out to these meetings is really good. I'm glad you guys are here. What I'd like to share with you uh, this morning is just some uh, essential concepts, uh, critical concepts involving investigation of medical devices, which invariably many of you get sucked into whether you want to or not. Of course, 22 years of my career, I spent in three different hospital systems, and just by default almost, and also getting a plane, which we often tend to do for when things go wrong. That's how I sucked into it, and then even after, during that time, I ended up doing a number of expert witness cases over the years involving medical devices, and uh, kind of learning the hard way on what to do and what not to do. So this is where I kind of, kind of like to go. There's a tremendous amount of really good material out there, resources available. VA has put out a really good guidebook. Uh, if you're looking for some tangible, hardcore uh, documentation, the number of papers that your has done some work. Of course, after ECRI, uh, 50 years ago, they started in pioneering the approach to doing investigating medical devices. And one of the things that comes out of this kind of documentation and this research you see, and most universities agree upon. The best approach that we currently have for finding out what went wrong is through an interdisciplinary team kind of effort. And if you're own institution, if you're fortunate enough to have such a team, uh, the, the typical and often the, the functional structure is having risk management kind of the, the lead uh, oversight group in, in, the, in that team, just because of their role in the hospital, the legal authority that they often have. But uh, HTM clinical engineering, which you clearly have a seat at that table. We are the technology experts within the institution, and uh, even people from the facilities, clinical representation is also crucial. One of the benefits, obviously, if you can do this, and some of this is theoretical, but there's no places that are doing it, and you can see a ton of mileage coming out of it, is you, you, we simply get different disciplines, see things differently. You can look at things just like looking at the pointer, depending on the position you look at, you see something completely different. And uh, an interdisciplinary team approach uh, is tremendously, tremendously useful. So whether we want to do it or not, being the techie, very deep we are, our, our focus, understandably, is on the technology side. That's kind of what we do read. And uh, whereas clinicians, they're more patient centered because that's what they do, doesn't read. We you bring these all together, we get a lot of good team approach. The downside, however, is because of our different backgrounds, invariably it can create communications problems. We just don't think the same, we don't speak the same language. There's also often a little bit of uh, insidious ass covering kind of a thing going on where we tend to be protective of our technology. You know, it's our stuff that's not broke, whereas the clinicians are more protective of their users. And so there's there's little bits of bias in there that can creep up and show us up again of power struggles. So it, it takes a good leadership uh, to keep this kind of a, a group functioning. So what I'd like to go essentially look at the fundamental purpose of why we do these things in the first place, why it's so crucial to investigate incidents. We want to look at some of these different perspectives that can both complement but they can also work against us in trying to understand what really happened. And then near the end I have a handful of actual case studies just, just to kind of exemplify how these concepts may have worked. And not have worked. So the obvious why we do it, why we investigate incidents, why we should, is all really improve safety, patient safety. And the way we can fundamentally do that is in terms of exactly what happened, the cause, what were the, the, the situation, the thoughts, all of that set, bring the harm or the death. And then the ideal goal is to prevent the need for the occurrence. Sounds very simple, but that's fundamentally what we're all trying to do. And this is no different than what the NTSB does. National Transportation Safety Board. They're, they use their interdisciplinary teams when an aircraft goes down, airplane goes down within hours. Literally, they're on site going through the wreckage, going through the bodies. They do psychological autopsies on, on pilots. And uh, it's from that team effort that they ultimately reconstruct, figure out what happens. And it's precisely one of the reasons, the biggest reason aviation safety is so high is because of all the Things that we've learned from those tragedies. Um, now, if you know John Hans, used to be an aviation correspondent on ABC News. He's written a number of books, presented extensively on why hospitals should adopt some of these 
concepts from aviation. And some ways they're really doing that. And um, there's a tremendous amount to be learned from how to reconstruct access and learn from literally suck every morsel of insight, knowledge out of these strategies that we can possibly do. And once we have that information, we can go on and make things better, which is precisely what aviation is so good at. The VA, any of you guys from the VA, the VA system in here? You know, despite all the things we have to get over the years, one of the things they have done is incredibly well. 20 years ago now, 1999, they started a National Center for Patient Safety model almost exactly after the NTSB. It's like 170 some VA hospitals, I think. They have each, there's a representative from each of those hospitals on the Center for Patient Safety. They have a main office, I think, out of Ann Arbor, one in Washington, D.C. But they do the exact same kinds of things. A number of years ago now, I don't know, 10 or more, if you may recall, there was an outbreak of either as an endoscopes or colonoscope contamination somewhere in the country. And they initially didn't know what was causing. They were cross contaminating patients. And just like the NTSB uh, will go in and ground the whole fleet of airlines, VA said, We're not doing these procedures anymore until we can figure out what's going on. They just stopped doing that. And uh, they could get away with it, but in the private hospitals, you work in any of the private places where you've got the soup docs, GI practices, you tell me not to do colonoscopies for two months, the hell we age, you know. And uh, so it would be very difficult to implement. But that's the kind of health benefit that you can get from that. About 10 years ago, I did a little editorial. I was so impressed by it. Uh, I thought, what a lot of concept it would be if we could have a national incident investigation organization a pattern with the authority given to the NTSB by law and had a skill set um, in an independence of say an equity kind of group and then also the mission overall mission and goals for um, the VA system. And I think you bring in all the generalized high kind of ideal things you potentially uh, would have lines. Frankly in healthcare by the time we're done here you'll see we're decades behind aviation in terms of learning truly learning from our mistakes and trenches decades behind. So what are the obvious goals if you, if you think about it? The, the, you know, the goals are pretty good injuries and deaths. And um, current estimates of some of the best studies are currently putting our numbers of accidental deaths in hospitals at about 400,000 a year. This is fine. And the same uh, author, John James, who did that pivotal study, estimates that injuries are by about 10 times that amount. So reducing injuries and death, the care, use air, obviously there's a tremendous amount of user anxiety. And a lot of careers, clinician careers are trashed after they're involved in a real devastating event. Um, we had a, a nurse at my school, the nursing department, she was a critical care nurse. She got sucked into a lawsuit involving a drug overdose that ultimately the show did not have happened. But so wrecked her confidence, she couldn't, she couldn't do clinical nursing anymore. So she came into academic. So it does a lot of damage, a tremendous amount of losses that we can uh, reduce as well. The other obvious goals of the patient outcome, satisfaction goes up, uh, clinical workflow is obviously optimized. The other benefit from this Medicare, um, it's about 14 different categories Medicare has. And if you have an adverse event in your hospital, infections, falls, um, say breaks, bone breaks, uh, they're not going to reimburse each other. So they're going to get the hospital in a pocketbook by saying, hey, this should have happened. So uh, we can try and get it uh, as a result. So these different perspectives that we have, again, these goals are kind of an obvious no greater thing. It's really no greater than our patient safety. But there's different perspectives as to how we get there and why we do that. So I'll just touch on some of these, these um, four major areas. And also I'll emphasize a little later is the legal side can be somewhat competing. Uh, up until just a few years ago, I finally got out and doing the actual witness work. I still do the forensic engineering, the investigative stuff, but I can't work with the, with the legal system anymore just because of the inherent nature of their process. And every case that I've worked on, I had a slight non disclosure agreement, so I would talk about the legal stuff. And a number of years ago, I said, I can't stay with the hell of it. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to get into detail from the case studies that I will present. Uh, they don't have obviously patient detail here, but the essence of the injuries and the death. It's imperative that we learn and evaluate these things. Otherwise, we're going to learn. And so that's where it could be somewhat competing. We'll touch on that a little bit. 
way to from an ethical professional perspective, and I don't think there are a lot of us ever think about this, but from the engineering perspective, and this, this applies to all engineering disciplines, not just biomedical, mechanical, civil, electrical, software, computers, is that the public protection of the public is not a high obligation. And we have to a higher standard in the society because we're from a learned profession, we're supposed to know better. And society expects more out of us. So it's the protection of public health is from a ethical professional perspective is why we need to engage conscious of this as well. Top of the fundamental canon, paramount safety of the public. Uh, we could never, ever, ever forget the responsibility that we have, especially working in a hospital environment where patients are at the worst, most vulnerable. Uh, it's an obligation. It also gives us a structure and a framework to just kind of do whatever we want to, to, to keep things safe. Clinicians have the same, same charge. They're the Hippocratic Old First Two Farm, even Florence Nightingale, right or some 60 years ago, had the insight that the first requirement of a hospital that it should do more harm. She'd probably be flipping in her grave right now. She knew how, how goofy and things are in our, in our environment. Okay, so then that's a ethical component. From a regulatory perspective, there's some obvious FDA requirements. These are federal mandated laws, a law that user facilities, uh, once you become aware, you don't even need to have proof. If you just suspect the device has been involved in a patient injury, you have an obligation to report it. And manufacturers have that same uh, obligation as well. This is from one of the VA uh, guidebooks that is out there. And we've got about 10 days, 10 working days, once you become aware. And you don't even have to, typically, you don't have to do the investigation more than you complete 10 days. So you're not always going to, not going to have full picture, you're not going to have both causes. But if you just suspect that a device was involved, injury or death, you have a mandate to report that uh, incident. And this is typically should this reporting should typically come from your your your, your team. The risk management group should be the one submitting formally submitting the report. But it's so crucial, and this is a critical do and the don't from the legal perspective. You want to be very very careful how these reports are written. In that you could almost almost bet, which we'll touch on this concept of discovery in a little bit, but uh, anything that you write down, you can expect that there is a lawsuit, both parties in the lawsuit are going to get access to it. So it's a, it's a real fine line when you walk, and that's why crucial people on your team build these reports up. You want to do the right thing, but you don't want to get yourself in trouble by implying or suggesting claim somebody screwed up. Uh, it's just it's just for the facts that you know at the time. Try to leave some opinions. Uh, any again, inflammatory language on there. You can almost bet it's going to come back and you the ask big time to imply that somebody screwed up. And um, even if that other information is shown that it would happen, you want to be very careful uh, in how those reports are made. So initially, it's about getting as much information as you can. Uh, also, if there is a death involved, um, it can be really helpful, you know, to give Equity a call or find some other reputable person out there that you can retain to come and help you. So some of these studies can just take a tremendous amount of time, which you may not have in your own facilities to do, and it can, it can give you a lot of uh, potential help. Um, so you don't want to go all half cocked on your own outside of your professional or responsibilities within your organization, but that report needs to be you know, done. Because that can come back and bite you as well if you don't, don't do that. What another study from but the Inspector General a number of years ago, about seven years ago, they, they did a study on hospitals reporting what they were reporting, what they were not reporting, and they found a disturbingly large number, about 86%. Or events throughout the country weren't being reported. 86%. And their conclusion was that partly they just didn't know they didn't want to report. The other, the other component was it just scared the shit out of the report. They were afraid to report it for fear of you know getting reprimanded, fired, or different lawsuits. And so the type of tendency was let's just make it make it go away. It's not reported. The tremendous insult that that represents is we don't work. 
Can you imagine where aviation would be right now if 86 percent of the plane crashes and never got investigated, we never followed out what caused it? 86 percent of bridges and things that fail, we never figured out what went wrong. That's what happens when we don't properly investigate these things, we don't learn. And from our engineering perspective, we'll see this is where most of us are coming from a technical scientific perspective. This is crucial to preventing things from happening in the future. And I don't know if you've heard of Henry Petrosky, the civil engineer back in the 80s, he's written a number of books on failure analysis, how we how we learn, how things fail. And he's got a number of great concepts in there. Yeah, we don't want failure, we don't want to injure kill people, but we also don't want to let that that debt go to waste. There's a tremendous amount of rich information often embedded in these tragedies that just again mandates us to figure out what the hell went wrong. If you think about our own profession, the only time we really, really learn stuff is when things blow up. In the show, it blows up, planes crash, bridges fall. You know, like, damn, yeah, how did that happen? You know, so we got to dig in there and find out. If we got to pour concrete, steel, or coal, or something, that's how we find out. That's how we find out. I also thought it was just also, also a medical insult to, to society and the science, but it's also an insult to the injured patient. You know, the families of someone that's been killed or been lost. Uh, by not figuring out what went wrong. And to do this, however, in our environment, we often need different kinds of reasoning skills. And we have heard these terms before, deductive and inductive reasoning. And there's a very different mindset we have to have going into these things. And fundamentally, the deductive reasoning, uh, this is what the CSI people do, the detectives do, a little different. From a forensic perspective, the hospital environment trying to figure out what went wrong, we start out with the event. Somebody died. Well, how did that happen? So we, we have this initial event. We start out with some hypothesis or some kind of an idea of what we think may have happened. Gather the facts. We'll see how we do this a bit, and then we can come to some, hopefully, some correct conclusions and ultimately the root cause. A big, big Problem in doing this kind of approach, however, is the bias that we might bring into the process. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly ashamed to tell you that for the first time in about 10, 15 years, I, we, we had a very kind of derogatory negative view of clinicians. User error, we call it, you know, and um, dumb nurse, dumb doctor, it's a bastard, what they have, what they have. Well, we frankly, you walk into an ICU, you got a seasoned school physician with a master's degree, maybe you imply or suggest that they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're gonna slice your staff off. You know, you can't talk like that. But um, that bias is kind of a national thing that we can bring into these events that uh, we really, really got to kind of work on that and try to cut that out. Okay, even if it's true, even if they screwed up, you want to be very careful on assuming that. So you start off with some preliminary ideas, and you almost kind of you know, hold these kind of close to the to the vets. You be careful about who you start sharing your initial suspicions with. But you, you start out with some kind of idea of what may have happened. Collect as much evidence as you possibly can. This is the photographs, uh, the, the air on downloadable sort of it, and you do that there is much information that you can, which can be difficult to see in a bit. And then, once you've done that, you're able to do some kind of analysis of putting the pieces together. And if we do this right, if we do this correctly, what we're ultimately able to do is we're able to replicate the incident. Many times, obviously, ethically, we can't go cut off a patient's arm again to see if our theory is correct. We can't go kill somebody to see if our theory is correct. But we can potentially simulate Get graphic illustrators like you'll see on the planes, they'll take the data from the black boxes and they'll make these animated illustrations of what the plane was physically doing. So, there's things we can do to improve our overall observation. This is a, a field case, this is not really how a lot of us fundamentally think. Much of our training in our classes, for example, is all based on in them. All of the labs you may have had back in your school days, experiments doing old law experiments, letting them an LED. We start out doing these little experiments looking for relationships with does V really equal I times R? Okay. 
and we work up the tree in this in this context. So if, if like, we have to do some experiments, for example, in the course of an investigation, this is often the process that we might now refer to. And if we're really lucky, and we can show a very consistent, repeatable relationship between current and voltage, for example, you got yourself a swap. It's not going to be once you get to that level. That's kind of a mother load in science is to get to that point. But just the difference in how we approach, how we think. And why we use these, need these techniques, this is the world that you got to This is a nightmare. And this is not at all in common. So Nick, you hear, you can hear swell by all of this advances of technology, the adult and an ICU, anesthesiologist. And if you guys look at different hospitals, you'll see different, there's no standardization here. You know, every hospital does their own thing based on what they have to work with, based on the available space. Unlike aviation, you get in the cockpit of a 747, they all look the same. The controls, dials, knobs, all of that human factor stuff, usability stuff, has been worked out, optimized, not in our environment. What this kind of stuff does, if you, you're a clinician, your focus obviously is on the patient, but they got to navigate all of that stuff. stuff. And that puts what we call a tremendous cognitive burden on the clinician head. They, 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 they just overwhelm the hell out of me because they got to deal with all of that stuff. And so, uh, it's the complex systems within systems. So we need to bring in that kind of systems thinking. And my idea of systems now, I'm sure you how we kind of grew up. That's the exact same way. Early on, this was my stuff, right? This is our machine. This is what we work with. I you know, like a little bug on a tree. You know, I couldn't even know I didn't know it was a force. You know, it's got a little bit bigger environment. But if you think about the system that we work in, We've got, you know, large fatigue, blood level issues in our critical care units, temperature, electrical lighting, gas issues. If your if your uh, radiology department is a block away from your ED, and you're going to head trauma patients down hallways, up elevators, over thresholds, that creates facility issues. And uh, at the center of all of this, obviously, is the patient, clinician, and the machine interface, where it all comes together. And this is probably one of the most complicated aspects of our entire system, is where the machine and the patient literally are one. It's not a big thing, obviously. We do, this is nowhere else would be big direct delivered electrical connections to patients' bodies, uh, fluid connections, heart lines, central venous pressure lines, intracranial pressure lines. Uh, if they're not metal, you got a magnetic. More up there, all sides of it. Got to go into the bathroom anytime soon, right? So it's like we got a fully catheter in as well. So every orifice we got, you know, we can, we're going to put something in there just because we can't. We're going to have a over this. Got some new ones on That's what we do. That added tremendous complexity to the added burden. And you think about, again, all of this a little bit more. All of our technology is really increasingly intelligent. It's trying to communicate with the user through waveforms, numeric values, icons, alarms, and the human clinician has to interpret that stuff and then appropriately interact with the machine. And in the middle of that, of course, is the patient. So this is really it's almost an intimate closed loop of sorts when it works well. Everybody is talking and working together. There's a lot of things that can go on here as you guys probably painfully know. And um, you may have seen clinicians, I don't know how many times I've seen nurses, doctors look at this thing. You know, something didn't work right. And you've got a patient in ventricular fibrillation or in this earlier. You kind of understand why they go outside. Because they're so, so dependent on their stuff, this technology. And um, so they go crazy. Yeah, they have to be increasingly convinced of uh, one of the reasons we get so frustrated when our stuff doesn't work. It's almost like the technology is mocking us. You stupid, you don't know what you're doing. Hey, 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 hey. So you, you watch the remote into the wall. And, uh, and humans are not. This, this is our this is the blame of a lot of engineering. We jammed in so much of our stuff, thinking it's cool, uh, but from a clinician's perspective, it can be kind of a nightmare. I don't know if you've ever seen this um, 
model mentor developed by a psychologist from the UK, James Reason. He came up with this Swiss cheese model of accident causation. I embraced this right from the beginning, and I just love it to death and continually use it to provide some structure going into an event. And what he basically said is in any environment that is intrinsically high risk, which healthcare is, air bacteria, nuclear power plants, where you're doing dangerous things, you have multiple inherent hazards up here, threats. And what we need to do is prevent those threats, prevent those threats and hazards from being current. In our case, getting to the patient. So we put up barriers, take different kinds of barriers along the way. We block these ever present threats tearing at the door, trying to get them to do harm. Some of them might be administrative. You hire the right people for the right job. You don't make them work 24 hours and two days kind of thing. Administrative policy kind of thing. We design our facilities so they have adequate airflow, temperature control, ventilation, power, gases, kinds of things. We get the best available equipment that we can for the for um, for the for the needed treatment. And then the user will be able to properly train as well. But what this model includes is that none of those barriers are Inherent flaws in them that are represented by the holes, the slices here. And um, when those holes align, as illustrated here, that's been the hazards. I also think in my head a little bit beyond just the holes, I think of the hole like a lot like they're fixed and they're moving around slowly. And one day they might be over here being safe, next day they might be aligned. So it's a, it's a wild kind of a framework that if you get your head around, that's kind of, this has always helped me just kind of go in and think of these holes that seem to find the active failures. This is what we typically think of when we think of abuse care. They hit the wrong button, they hit the wrong switch. Um, they did the wrong thing, is what he refers to as an active failure. And unfortunately, what we often tend to do, especially in our country, we like to, for some reason, we like to blame people. You know, it seems like once we blame somebody, it's like we, we solve the problem. The nurse screwed up, the doctor did the wrong thing, problem solved, proof caused, identified. Not often at all the case at all. And once you do that, we tend to just stop. So we, we do that, we don't tend to learn. What I really like is, is the other holes he refers to as the latent. And I really like that term, pathogens. Things that are in the system hanging out, we don't even know what they're there. It's like that hole that is going to ultimately fail. We don't even know it's there until we have an exam. The benefit of some of these is we get a more proactive approach. Sometimes we can identify where these latent defects are hidden in the system and do something about it. It's a really good model for the board to kind of keep our heads straight. So from a critical do or don't, uh, it's crucial that whatever policies you have internally, that you, you follow those and can work on meaningful policies. In other words, you don't want to go too far off the reservation within your own organization as well. Keep that biased, narrow perspective as long as you can, and that systems focus. Don't assume anything. And uh, you really, 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 really want to watch uh, the client expressing any kind of uh, that can do more of the whole on your investigation to shut things down than anything else. So there's just a handful of uh, critical steps here. Some of them you may have already kind of heard. These are what basically evolved over the last 30, 40 years. But again, the VA is adopted and FDA is implemented. Basic, basic kinds of things. Once the patient has been secured, safely taken care of, they're still living, uh, get them out of the way. Is that you want to record everything you possibly can related to the device, photographs, measurements, documentation, everything. Say, uh, try to save the disposables if you can get them. Sometimes they're tossed accidentally. Uh, they can be very, very uh, important. I uh, need a wrapper. Look in the garbage can and see the wrapper and say the captain may have come from. Lot numbers, model numbers, you're going to bring recall issues you might be able to identify from that. And so collect everything. Okay. Uh, the next one is really, really crucial. Many of our devices have built-in error models associated with it. They record kind of baked in. 
If the only if you know how to obtain that information without compromising it, then go ahead and do it. You have to be very careful that people overwrite or erase that information. Legally, that we'll see in a bit that can get you the whole world apart. We've lost these incredibly important pieces of the puzzle. A uh, case we'll be talking about a little bit later, um, ventilator case that we've worked on. I uh, had that kind of error log with all that information in it. So, when you put it out, if you're, if you're a little uncertain, if you haven't worked on a particular machine in a while, find it and then get the same model number, even if you have to go out and rent one. In a couple of the cases that I do, we went on a eBay and got the fusion books that I could play with before working on the one I actually bought. So you want to verify, make sure you, you just know this machine inside out backwards before you work on the actual all device if necessary. Also, what's incredibly helpful is to, to get the clinician to somebody to download the whatever the streaming into the patient's electronic medical record. It's critical time date stamps, uh, time stamps, especially that are going into that record that can be very, very useful later on in part of your analysis and putting the pieces of this puzzle together. Okay, obviously, another main one take the device out of service, um, sequester it while all of the consumable, all the supplies, and it's not going to go back into service until you have finished everything. You're often likely to get a bunch of pushback if you tell them what the device is. If it's something that you only have a few of, you're going to be out of service. You're going to have something that comes start pitching at you and say, Well, I didn't already do that for me. Yeah. I'll go on to get another one because this is your ethical obligation. We're not, you're not getting it back until we know what happened. This is where you got to kind of think of your own kid, the baby in an incubator that he didn't kill the kid. You know, you think of your own family member being attached to the devices. Receive kind of recording. Try not to clean or reprocess anything. You could just be damaging evidence there. If you've got some blood, body fluids, and tubings and catheters and things that don't get attention to flush it out with a 10% bleach solution or something. But generally, don't really try to clean the device at that time. Keep it plugged in. You don't just put it in the closet, but make sure you keep it plugged in. Three of these devices have a bit of multiple parameter that needs to keep power up to keep that error log, those error logs. Available. Uh, don't take any batteries out of it as well. Uh, invariably, when the manufacturer finds out they're going to want the device, that's often going to be one of the first things they're going to say, well, they'll have to just send the device in and check it off. But it's not going to be done because you know, you've lost custody of them at that point. You don't know what they're going to do. Okay? So it's so understandable that they're going to want to be involved, but don't let them do anything. If this thing ultimately did bubble up to a lawsuit, you're going to have to get the agreement on both sides before anybody gets access to things anyway. And then lastly, you won't return the device to the surface until you're 100% you know, sure you put it on your own family member. And if you're reasonably sure that it's not going to be involved in the lawsuit somewhere down the road. Okay, the legal side of things, this is where it often can get messy. And this is what's, in my opinion, one of the biggest impediments. Why we have not learned more from our adverse events is just because of the inherent nature of our legal process here. And this is often what happens if we have a patient incident, injury or death, and the family of the patient, the patient sues for the defendant's health, they may sue the hospital, for the caregiver, or the pharmacy manufacturer. And it often is very pricey. Some states have caps and limits on to how much damages. Can it be awarded to a patient? Hospital might have some protection. Physician probably do have some protection. Uh, so we'll go after the ones with the larger pockets off these multi manufacturers. And it's just the inherent nature of our legal system. This would be helpful if it did in so many ways. It's just very black and white, very binary. It's yes, no, on, off, right, wrong. It's, it's just that, that way. Okay. So this is where how you report and how much you record can become so crucial later on. Um, so the VA has detected a number of papers that have been coming out again over the last you know, 10 years or so, basically finding out that those hospitals that are just come right out and own their mistakes, honest transparency, hey, yeah, we screwed this up. We cut off your long way, 
We took out that good kidney where we should have been. You know, they got it. They bought it. They checked on the body. That, for some reason, has had a very powerful effect on reducing the number of losses. One of the things that just pissed his families off, the plaintiff's off is not getting any reasonable information. You, know, you just heard her damage killed by my relative here. You're not telling me what happened. And that's what often incentivizes the major to go out and spark costs. So the VA has adopted that transparency to be honest. Okay, as painful as it might be. So and you also have to basically fundamentally expect anything that you do record is going to get discovered in terms of the loss. And so you just have to plan on that. And uh, you know, attorneys on both sides will argue that that's privileged information. The hospital incident report is privileged, not necessarily. Uh, they can uh, change that wherever they, they may want to. Okay. The uh, some of the critical legal concept, all business concept, doctrine of discovery. It's a it's a, it's a simple way to give it that there is a lawsuit. Both sides of the party have access to everything that's out there. Okay. So every every test and measurement that you did. Uh, the, this was a lawsuit that the patient, uh, the defense attorney could come in, uh, they could subpoena all of the records from your scene. And that's related to a benefit of the machine. They have access to all of that stuff through discovery. They also can submit questions. The interrogatories are called. They can, they can ask any questions they want on both sides. And ultimately, they can propose you. And the definition is basically being backed by the information. Uh, to try and find out what the what folks can have in the event they should go to the The other key key concept here is spoliation. This is where downloading equipment law, air logs, event logs from machines can be so crucial. And if you don't do that carefully, you can destroy the evidence to the exclusion. I did a investigated a case of related death a number of years ago, a young 27-year-old guy in this country. Taser, and he died. And at the time, and still today, we don't know why that happens. And people who tased him, then this guy was one of them that died. And at the time, it wasn't illegal for private citizens to have tasers, so they did a court of judge. And then they go to the counties to get, get a special judge court order to get the taser. I took it back and this is the way they did it with test the taser, fired it in the different resistant modes and everything. And it's getting down the court of running out of bag, taser back. So I went online, of course, nobody's going to sell you taser stuff in Wisconsin is illegal. Just to get the cartridges, I had to go to a friend in Omaha and get it out of the time. So I had to do some back work, some of my illegal stuff, just to get the cartridges. I found another company that I could get the battery packs from. And I also got a download kit with a USB port of tasers, which kind of dates the very, very bad spider. And very detailed issue. The cop involved, brand new containers, he had never heard of using before. He had, he said he didn't remember how many times he tased the guy with the download, he was taking 12 times in class at this time. Well, I got the battery in, they changed the battery out, the taser was dead. What do I do now? No, just and to find out, I didn't know at the time the taser, the battery's gonna work faster. So this is how they upgrade the taser software. I can use a right and I have that illegal battery, but taser recognizes hey, this is not authorized, so shut me down. Unfortunately, the thing never went to court or trial. So I don't know what to do with the suit. I can only correct the evidence by putting that battery in that is wrong. Well, you're an expert, okay, this is running. How about it? You So you don't want to ever destroy the evidence. Um, you have some flexibility, it was accidental, it didn't mean to, but you still have an obligation. To keep it intact. So here's just a handful of actual case studies. I did about I can't remember how many it's just a few of them. And uh, so just go through with some of these looking at some of the events. But this one event involved a infant that was had multiple congenital birth defects. He was sent home on a rental a week or so at home, but uh, the family said that the machine just kind of quit and their baby died on a respiratory arrest and died. So they were going to file a suit against the manufacturer, the ventilator, and the attorney that they went to got to me and said, can you test this thing out? Is there any, is there any potential there in the case? So all I knew was given at the time, you know, maybe that guy, and I'm, you know, right away thinking, well, did they have the alarm going to step up? Were the alarms too low? Is that too low? You 
you know, they have big costs, you know, like you see in hospitals that cover like a water court. Get an old, you know, environments in your house are too noisy and what 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 I don't get to be old. So uh, pull up a service manual, obviously, and keep your model ventilator. I was fortunate to get an exemplar, the exact same model of that ventilator service manual, and I just went through it diligently multiple like a couple of months, relearning everything about that ventilator house, how to use it, how to set the alarms, and uh, came up with a whole little set of test procedures based on what the manufacturer recommended. This had to get approved by both targeting now potentially. And ultimately, I was able to download the event Very, very difficult process. Even the service manual did not tell you you could look at events one at a time, getting the right combination of both, but it didn't tell you how to actually download the data into a company. It was almost like it's a secret internal document that I got from the BioMed guy, a little BioMed talk website. Website he even sent me a special cable. It was a real funky RG, wasn't an 11 or a 45, it was some RG funky cable, a DB9 serial cable that we did well. Really difficult, cryptic thing to do. And it, the, the event of trace came down as a bunch of text, mushed out gibberish. So I had just looked all kinds of parsing kind of stuff, and ultimately to get it into a readable form, which we excerpted right about here. And what it tells us is that this code here. EXT LSP1 indicated external power. So either they lost power in the house or somebody who plugged the one right on the wall. So these events all have their own value. A minute later, they turned to somebody who turned it off. Time of date stamped, it was still accurate. They didn't call 911 for it. And as soon as the attorney Saw that he backed away and come out of here. There's a potential homicide here. It strongly suggested that somebody shut the ventilator off with the kid. I don't know, year, about a year or two later, totally unrelated case, another, another exact situation, but I knew how to do it now so quickly and efficiently. In this particular case, the ventilator was turned off here at 1 13 in the afternoon, it was turned back on at 5 08. This is a defense case. Defense lawyer don't want you to write nothing down. My instructions were test it out, call me up, don't write anything down, call me up, tell me what you I told him that, and he clearly got a whole lot more information than I did. Told him dead silence. I thought, could my question follow up? Question is, who was bleeding for the kid for four hours? And he clearly knew something was potentially another potentially fuzzy case. Um, there's a lot of those logs, without those logs. Um, Really, really crucial. Did you find the time and date stamp matched the correct time and date for the? It was still, it was still correct. But sometimes they'll, they'll get a little off. Yeah. You know, but in this case, a few minutes maybe. You know, for days. If the biomeds aren't checking that, then the event stamps are off too. Good point. Exactly what happens. Yeah. And it's a little easier to do from the front panel. You don't have to go the machine to do that. You know, but that's a really good point. They are off. Uh, uh, this kind of information is used. Like a defibrillator. Yep. Yeah. Match up. Pardon? If you had an event, the all the equipment that's used on that patient at that time and date should match up. Otherwise, it looks like it's a delay and we're going to defibrillate a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Like that would yeah. be a bad thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a case that happened in my last hospital. Well, at night, I kind of came back from the OR for bypass surgery. CPIC unit, the old lady went to cardiac arrest. And when it happened, it all was right. Literally, it all this patient's head in there. It's massive burns all over. So you can see the intensity of the fire, charring the stopcocks and no trade tubes, charring the defibrillator panel. And literally, the next morning, I got a call and I'm getting a What the heck is the problem with you people? You know, they assume instant assumption of the defibrillator panel. People are supposed to maintain this stuff. What's wrong with you? I'm including you. I'm including you. I'm including you. They're just jumping off from me. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. Let's find out what happened. You know, I mean, you know, I've seen sparks. You can get sparks. Smoke somebody up. Jesus. You know, so we would get all the classic things in there. I got as much information as I could. Nobody was talking. It's like, you're just coming to your ass. You 
I have to keep picking away to try to get information because one day it's not. They just you can imagine the nurse. That's what they look at McDonald's. It's just what happened. Was it oxygen rich environment? Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to point out. And then we're going to let you know the requirements. You got to have oxygen, fuel, and vision. But at the time, I didn't know. It was like a military really down chip puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, you know, all the pieces. And it literally took me almost two months of picking away little bits and pieces of information, trying to get this thing figured out. And the risk management people are the insurance carriers. This is a fun thing when we get to court. You don't want this kind of thing to hit the press. Where do people want to go to that box? They blow people up. So we took the triple air out service, all the disposable, gathered as much information as could for measures and everything. And ultimately, what I was able to put together this patient, big girl chest and tube. He went into cardiac arrest. First thing the nurses do, they read low the bed to so facilitate chest compressions, disconnecting the DT tube, the DT tube. The nurse does the machine get the bed all the way down? She just happened to be low for the small staff of five feet, five feet. And wasn't able to get the contact to the paddle. This is the Chicago paddle contact. So that was the jigsaw puzzle. And we got to assess the alien and then to reconstruct everything for risk, risk people. And this is ultimately what I was able to conclude. The ventilator, high up level two, 100% oxygen. She just disconnected the tube, stuck it by his neck. He had a squat on my hand, so I think four by four claws on his neck. Saturating the environment with fuel concentration level two. Again, very big dude, bed high, small nurse, can't wait for her, wasn't able to get any contact. But these older HP defibrillators, 300 joules, she got about seven pounds of conservative voltage there. Not good contact, fine. <laughs> and that's what we ultimately uh, concluded. So that's what I'm saying. So you've seen that one before, maybe, huh? I know, it just made sense. Just too much oxygen there. Yeah, see, so that's the benefit of our knowledge and our background. It's kind of the first thing we start to think about. That's what's so helpful in forming these hypotheses. So, this is a kid that a toddler was in for some heart surgery uh, in, the, in the OR, came back to the pediatric ICU with multiple IVs, so not all of them. And one of the IVs was epinephrine, which is often given after heart surgery, which is a very powerful prolotropic and atropic agent to help weak heart. A little better, and the patient stabilized that for a couple of hours, so they discontinued the empty line, inspired an IV of packed red cells in the same, same pump. The nurse came back about a half hour later, the whole thing had been caught. Patients had cardiac arrest, they were able to resuscitate, revive the patient with permanent brain damage. And so the question is, how did that happen? Uh, hospitals maintaining, hey, we've had a history. These little plastic bullets breaking out on this pump. This pump sucks. This is what caused it. That was their position. And I got retained by the manufacturer to answer the question can we, can we even operate the pump? Is it even possible to operate the pump with this broken roller here? So I did it on eBay and I got a couple of these pumps. I didn't want the manufacturer to give me one of their pumps, but I would have this argument you know, the same. It wasn't altered. Got a couple of them off of eBay and did a whole number of tests on them, looking at the exact process, full mechanisms, how all of these different valve pins and plungers work to engage this disposal cassette. But when this cassette is in the pump, these little valve pins are controlling the flow and also triggering the potential alarm movements that are needed. I got I just got a yellow color in there just to make it easier. To see. We also did some tests on the cassette. The cassette had some really sweet features to it. It's got a little valve here that the nurse can pull it on and do a fast flush, a real quick finding a feature. They can also dial it in like a little needle valve to use it as a passive flow control kind of noise. Okay, so that characterized how that thing would behave. But it only took about a tenth of an inch, a couple millimeters, to fully open and close. I don't think this video will work here. Oh yeah, you see what's happening? How the pump takes control over the pump, the cassette. 
The door is closed. Now the third step enters. The pump closes the valve. You see that as the, as the door is closed, the pump takes over control of the step. When you take it out, it closes the valve. The other thing I ask myself, well, how could we break these door walls off? They were saying it's happening all the time. Behind the break the door wall off. I thought, oh, they missed, they didn't have the cassette properly seated. They busted the door roller off. There was about 30 pounds of force. You know, I think a reasonable nurse, a user of that technology, they need that kind of resistance to make it close and not right. But, so that's how we can shear that pump off. And the question was could you even operate the pump with a broken door roller? You know, we said, yeah. If I keep the door shut, turn the pump on, and held it that way for about 10 seconds while I was going through the self test, I could let you know the pump was going like this. It was At least for a while. What I also revealed, however, is that the pump of force can be right between three and seven pounds. If I had too little force, I could go on. If I had too much force, I could go on. So there's a little window of force there that if it's applied to all that thing thing you want. But the question is, what kind of reasonable thing a nurse would do? Because holding that thing down, you're feeling it. Plus, the pump is working fine with the patient around the pediatric disease. So, I did no longer exemplary test things. The pump couldn't operate without the broken door holder. And I essentially, uh, what I concluded is that the line was in flat top somehow, that the regulator and flow valve got activated and the line wasn't quite off. Okay. I didn't say the nurse didn't do a job, it's that the line wasn't quite off. And there's a tremendous amount of literature out there. Unfortunately, why did the same this we have multiple IDs going on? This is also a case involving a laparoscopic gallbladder surgery. And oddly enough, I went through the exact same procedure just in case. And I go for a gallbladder, laparoscopic gallbladder man. You know, I think all this worst case scenario is going to die. And if you've seen these procedures before, incredibly effective, useful surgery. Uh, what happened this middle aged guy did it for the procedure. About a week later, he was having increasing amount of discomfort, and not just running off the surgical pain. He was home, he collapsed, died about a week later, massive paraphernalia. The autopsy, what they showed is that there was a massive hole part right into the stomach. The stomach kind of is just plugging the pain. And that's what he died from. So I had no clue as to how that could have happened. So I looked at the patient, the OR records, what equipment was involved in the procedure. And also went on to the literature. I found it really quite surprising that there's this incident accident out there for insulation failure in these lab laparoscopic instruments. Because they're often cold sterilized. They're like blue all the kind of a solution, cold solution, and over repeated sterilizations and insulation. And ultimately, that's what I concluded happened uh, in this, this case. What was really ironic and unfortunate, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the decision for a company that makes a device to be used with an electrosurgical unit. Basically, it's kind of analogous to a ground ball circuit world. The bit detects straight on coming out of the probe, and so they shouldn't come up, it should shuts off the DSU. They had that right on the curve, on the same curve that the DSU was on, but they didn't use it for some reason. They had they used it, that case likely would not have had that happen. And so the CS people, they're encouraged, we found it, they're probably not going to do this, but to routinely inspect the insulation of these instruments. And some of can't just visually tell if the insulation is a tech, especially at high frequency, high voltage is involved in electrical surgery. Okay, so the bottom, the bottom right here kind of is to treat every event. Academic injury death is a precious thing opportunity. Again, an obligation that you have to ethically, morally, legally find out what happened. Uh, despite all the pushback you might get in the process, but you're going to do what you should do. But you have an obligation to do that. Um, seek to identify the active failures, holes in the Swiss cheese, because that's the only way you can improve the barriers. You know, you can get rid of the Swiss cheese and put a piece of purple or something. Oh, really? 
really good barrier to protect the barrier. You can't do that unless you're full time or you're not. Try not just to manage the last error. This is a really tempting trap that we get sucked into once we found out that the nurse didn't correct the line. We think we could have done it. Not at all true. We never would have the big picture appreciation of the complexities of managing multiple IVs um, at the same time. And then uh, lastly, do whatever you can to not blame. If you have a culture of blame in your organization, uh, you're not going to come into anywhere. And people are going to be definitely afraid of reprimand, retribution, fire. Uh, it's already seen where that nurse in that um, infusion pump case should have said her home. She was just devastated. And even during deposition, of like months and months later, she just melted and came apart. She was living at that floor of that event. And for clinicians whose primary calling is caregiving, you can imagine what a an obscene affront that is to their very soul. The thing that they had to do. So, um, anything we can do to not, not do that, believe. And again, the only failure really is where we learn, learn nothing. So, there's a lot to be learned from this. The, the downside still, however, is that we cannot go and talk about and publish this stuff enough. Uh, for fear of getting sued, many of my other peers that are around the country that have done similar work, they kind of gave me some shit like, what are you doing? We can't talk about this. We have to talk. We don't have to get into the specifics. We can keep the confidentiality, get the stuff control, but without learning the mechanisms of these cases, we have to learn. This is precisely why we're decades behind aviation. So, does that make some sense? Maybe? Maybe. Any question about your ESU, the one that you just went over? Sure. We do third party biomedical uh, work. I mean, the surgery centers, I don't get a hold of these. Uh, so you mean how do well you get that you get that Yeah, 
change that. It had to matter what the unit was. There was a male in it that wanted to see that. Yeah, we also work as a political person. It's a natural thing to do. You want to get in the final thing. What the hell is dumbass thing with that? My college brother got a natural thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a very understandable kind of thing. What do you do with the manufacturer that has the claiming plausible deniability? Um, let's say, for instance, to protect the innocent, um, there's a manufacturer, I won't mention any names, that has. Uh, has a device that sustains human organs being you know, alive prior to transplant. Yeah. One manufacturer. I won't mention any names. The manufacturer claimed that the device failed to sustain the organ because of poor hospital power. Okay? But yet the device has no history. For its um, backup power supply to fail, and that you know UPS internal to the device had a tendency of failing, and we all know that inherently hospitals do not have good quality power. Yeah, for the most part, you do you know generator testing, etc. You know stray RF, you know it's it's tough on the hospital. They use the analogy where, uh, okay, uh, Biomed had claimed that, well, the hospital apparently doesn't have the power. And then they kind of like latched on to that to justify the failure by, I guess, this service history indicating that they actually placed the UPS internal like, set aside. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's incredibly powerful evidence having precedence on it. Of a pattern, you can show a pattern, and it might be highly likely the company knows that. It's not, they all say, Well, we've never seen that. They just aren't telling you they saw it. But the dumb thing about it is that you know, the organ wasn't used in the surgery. But yet, let's say if that organ would have been necessary for that transplant, the enough organ isn't viable because the device failed to keep. Yeah. Yeah. That goes back to what you started with. They don't show to how this rings on that path. Yeah. If you not care, if you really believe the hospital off the book, anything for much less medicine on it before you ship or send anything to the manufacturer. Yeah, they may have used that very information, try to use it against you. Yeah, uh, the device reporting that work because of uh, that research you can maybe find where it is kind of good instances where that has happened, they may not happen. So if you can bring that in there, unless you own records, you've got a much bigger chance of defending yourself. It's unfortunate that so much of that information is hidden and protected by like that. That's precisely the kind of stuff people should know about so they can fix this stuff. Liability of fears of suit and of course the market share can go to hell and get word of that, you know. Anyway, appreciate you guys being here and we have a good rest of the show.